Welcome to the Rights Track Podcast, which gets the hard facts about the human rights challenges facing us today. In Series 6, we're asking if and how our human rights are threatened by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Todd Landman. In today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Maki Ramakrishnan, a refugee rights activist and founder of Beyond Borders Malaysia, an NGO which works to promote and protect the rights of refugees and stateless persons in Malaysia who are fleeing internal conflicts and persecution in their home countries. Maki is a multiple award-winning filmmaker and investigative journalist and uses her documentaries to highlight issues related to trafficking, including the sexual, physical, mental, and emotional violence unleashed against refugees and particularly against women and girls. She uses the creative arts to give refugees a voice and to lobby the Malaysian government for a comprehensive refugee policy. So welcome, Maki. It's wonderful to have you here all the way from Kuala Lumpur. Hello. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. I was just reflecting about uh, the issue of refugees, and we had a, an episode on the rights track a, a few years ago with Gonzalo Vargas Llosa, who is, uh, works for the UNHCR mostly in the European context. And we were discussing European refugees and the flow of refugees from conflicts in Syria, refugee sites and resettlement areas in Jordan, Turkey and Lebanon. And media has been really focused on this region in the world. And yet you work on refugees in South Asia and Southeast Asia. So could you tell us a little bit about the nature and extent of the problem in that region of the world? Actually, we always get into the limelight when there is an exodus of the of the Rohingya into Malaysia or when there is uh, persecution and many are fleeing Bang- uh, Burma into Bangladesh or Malaysia. But the thing is, Malaysia, we have about uh, half a million refugees easily and about 200 or more, 200,000 or more are from Burma and they are the Rohingya. So they make up the largest group of refugees in Malaysia, followed by the other ethnic groups in Burma. And then, of course, we have people from Syria, Palestine, Somalia, Sudan, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. So we have a a huge community of uh, refugees in Malaysia. And I'm sure you already know that, that the government hasn't ratified the refugee convention, which means that these refugees do not actually have a a legal status to be here. Um, They rely on registration by the UNHCR to give them some sort of a legitimate presence in Malaysia. But other than that, you know, I must say that while the government has allowed for refugees to be here, but on and off, we do have uh, immigration raids and we do have uh, police raids, which makes it incredibly difficult for the refugees. There's no right to work, education and healthcare or or proper access to healthcare and education, I must say, and refugees are not allowed to work. So it's definitely a very precarious situation for the refugees, uh, asylum seekers in Malaysia. So Malaysia is a multi-ethnic, multilinguistic uh, society. It's it's made up of different religion, different ethnic groups. And then layered into that, you've just explained that there's this uh, broad panoply of people on the move coming from uh, many parts of the world, uh, from South Asia, but also Middle East and, and, and of course, from, from Burma. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Rohingya? Um, because a lot of our listeners will kind of know about what happened in, in, uh, in Rakhine, but uh, w- what's the background of the Rohingya? And they themselves are, are, are disenfranchised in, uh, within Burma as well, and now come to Malaysia and have this kind of de facto um, legal status, but not really de jure legal, legal status as refugees. You know, I went to Burma, uh, I think, three times in 2017. And, you know, while Malaysia talks about uh, racial unity, um, it's not really there. And but when I went to Burma, I was shocked at the kind of, uh, you know, the, the lack of racial unity amongst the many different ethnic groups, because every ethnic group in Burma is being persecuted, whether you're a Karen, Kachin, Chin, you know, Zomi or a Rohingya. But the difference is that the Rohingya are stateless in their own home country because the Burmese government for some reason says that they are Bangladeshis and so they do not have the right to be citizens in Burma, even though in the 60s, you know, there was a a radio station which was broadcasting in their language and they were part of the of, of the system, the country system, but all that went downhill when you know the government decided that suddenly they are rid- that their citizenship, I'm sorry, needs to be revoked. So that triggered the exodus into Malaysia. Late 70s, we already have you know hundreds and thousands of Rohingya fleeing into Malaysia, and they have settled down here for more than three decades now. Three or four generations of Rohingya are in Malaysia at this point in time. But you know, if you really look at it, you will see that the Rohingya, unfortunately, because of the of the fact that they do not have education and you know there is no 
performing arts, for example, and they have literally forgotten their culture because of the fact that they were busy trying to stay alive in Burma. They kind of occupy the lowest stratification in, in Malaysia because the need for capacity building where the Rohingya are concerned is that much more higher. And I must say that the, there is deep seated patriarchy amongst the Rohingya compared to the other uh, my, uh, refugee groups which are in Malaysia at this point in time. So if I pick up on this point about patriarchy, I, I, I watched your documentary film about uh, trafficking, um, sexual exploitation of young girls, forced marriage, forced brides, as it were. Could you tell us a little bit about that culture? Because one of the things that struck me about the film is that there are members of the Rohingya community openly saying that they're, you know, saving money so that they can buy a bride for the future. So this and this is something that's kind of culturally embedded within the community. Could you say a little bit more about that? So child marriage isn't just uh, exclusive to the Rohingya community. You see it is in the sub-Indian continent. You also see it in Malaysia. And uh, it's an incredibly sensitive topic for us to talk about in Malaysia because then, you know, you need to bring in the, the issue of religion and, and that becomes really complicated and can get you into trouble, actually. But the thing is, when you really look at the Rohingya, then you see that, you know, child marriage is something that's very much a part of the culture. It's very much something which is being practiced. And chances are, it's also because they feel, the parents feel that it's okay for their girl child to be married for some semblance of security because of the internal persecution that's ongoing in Burma. And also when they come to Malaysia, the lack of uh, legal framework, the lack of protection and safety mechanisms also make it incredibly difficult for the parents to kind of find a proper footing for the for the girl child. So they think that, you know, it's OK if the child is married off and, you know, that there is a husband and things will be better. But unfortunately, I'm sure from the, the film itself, you will know that that is not a, the case because a lot of these girls are abandoned by the husbands when they get pregnant as if though it's, you know, it's it was a single responsibility, but that's what is happening. And because of the lack of job, you know, it feeds into the domestic violence as well, leaving these uh, girls in a very precarious situation. Now, when I first started uh, researching for the film, the reason I wanted to do it was because it, in, in, it involved the element of trafficking, but it was only when I was researching that I realized that a lot of the men that I was talking to were actually commissioning child brides from traffickers. Now, that did make me furious at one point, but then I was also trying to understand why that was happening. But, you know, it was just also equally shocking that a lot of them, actually all of them said that the reason they wanted uh, a child bride who was like 13, 14 from their own place in Burma was because, you know, the girls here are more open, they have been more exposed to a different culture and may not be that obedient. So you can already see the kind of patriarchy. And I must say, having been to Burma three times, having been to the internally displaced uh, people's camps, I understood that the Rohingya, they have observed and they have internalized the kind of persecution unleashed against them by the military and the Burmese government. And they were now, or, and they are now uh, doing the same thing to the people who are most vulnerable in their community, their women and children. It's about the, you know, the, the, the husbands controlling their wives, the parents controlling the children, not allowing the daughters to go to school or not allowing them to be, to, to be kept in school as long as possible. And that's really, it's a difficult situation, but I guess it's going to take a lot of work to, to kind of shift and change the mindset. Yes, yeah, so it feels like history repeating itself and, the, and these cultural practices are, are exported, these hierarchies are exported to a new location. And like you say, the challenge then is, is, is you know, obviously it's political, legal, socioeconomic, but also deeply cultural um, to challenge some of these uh, uh, assumptions and predispositions and, uh, you know, uh, expectations around the roles uh, that women perform in, in, in society. And some of that, of course, just gets reified and almost antiquated in a way, because in the new location, there's a certain nostalgia for the old way of life. And therefore, they're using financial transactions to uh, to, to bring young girls into into the new location. But if I may add, you know, I must say that having worked with the Rohingya community for about 16, 17 years now, I'm amazed at the, at the kind of leadership that we are seeing amongst the women. You know, women standing up for themselves, standing up for the other women, taking up leadership positions, despite the fact that there is a backlash from amongst uh, their own community, from the men in their community. And that to me is incredibly encouraging. 
Yeah, it's risky, but it's encouraging, right? Um, now, I wonder, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, the, the COVID pandemic, because if I listen to you, I, it, this is a large number of people on the move on a regular uh, daily, weekly basis, people moving in and out of, of various regions of the world, coming to Malaysia. And yet Malaysia, of course, is, is very concerned about the, the pandemic. There were a number of movement control orders uh, and try to keep up the people uh, from, from moving and mixing and trying to re- reduce community transmission. So how has all that affected your work? Actually, uh, from last year, March, uh, April, you know, we were shocked to see the kind of hate and uh, backlash and xenophobia against the Rohingya. It started with the Rohingya community and then spread out to include other refugees and also migrant workers. So, you know, because it was so well planned and so well coordinated, you know, it was quite clear to us that a, a, a group of people or maybe some influential people were actually pumping money to, uh, to kind of get trolls to actually attack any form of discourse or any form of pledge of solidarity with the, the refugees, including the Rohingya. But then what happened was a few months down the line, we saw that the, the xenophobia was still there, the backlash was still there. And then, you know, we realized that the, the society itself is such a xenophobic, racist society. And I must say, when it was happening, I was deeply ashamed to call myself a Malaysian. Because the the way they were treating the refugees and the migrant workers was just uh, completely appalling. But then when I take a step back and I try to analyze it, I realize that for a long, long time now, you know, amongst the three major groups of people in Malaysia, the Malays, the Chinese and the Indians, there were a lot of dissatisfaction. And, you know, there were some people who thought that they were either second or third class citizens, that they were not getting equal opportunities as citizens of this country. So when it is already a difficult situation, you bring in the equation of refugees and undocumented migrant workers into this equation. And I believe that those who felt that they were not getting what was legitimately theirs were already thinking, oh my God, what am I going to get now? I'm already being fed bones. Is that also going to be taken away from me? I'm not t- saying that this is the right way of thinking, but I'm saying that this has also played into the backlash and the xenophobia. But then, you know, if you look at the government, if at all, I would have expected the government to have learned a lesson from the pandemic that in order for me to be fine, the other person has to be fine. The refugee has to be fine. The undocumented migrant worker has to also be safe, has to have equal access to healthcare, equal and proper access. But until today, we have not seen a comprehensive healthcare policy that includes everyone that make up the fabric of the Malaysian society. And to me, I feel as if though we have actually lost out on something really big. And now, you know, we continue to see lockdowns after lockdowns and some form of movement control, which is making it incredibly difficult for the refugees who do precarious work. They are finding it incredibly difficult to actually work, to travel from one place to the other. And it's the same for the undocumented migrant workers as well, because of the of the kind of scrutiny by enforcement in, in Malaysia. So you, you said some really important things there. One one uh, question I have before we get into some of the, the, the legal issues is, uh, you know, in terms of an epidemiological approach, um, were case rates, death rates, transmission uh, rates any higher within the refugee community, roughly the same, or did you simply not have the data to make that determination? Well, from what we have been seeing over the last one year, slightly over a year, you know, it's largely amongst the migrant communities. To me, this is karma. This is like poetic justice, because for decades, we have been treating migrant workers like subhuman beings. I have seen and documented and made films about migrant workers and the living conditions were just beyond appalling. I mean, it was just like, you know, human bodies piled on top of each other, you know, living in small quarters, you know, hundreds of people living in a, in a small space. And, you know, that has actually made it impossible for social de- distancing and has also contributed largely to the number of uh, infections that we are seeing. In fact, just a few days ago in the east coast of Sarawak, we saw again a high number of uh, infections in immigration detention centers. So besides the living con- quarters of uh, migrant workers, we are also seeing high levels of infections in places where, where inmates are being held, whether it's immigration or police. Uh, uh, police uh, holding cells as well. So it's clear that we really need to rework the way we look at the criminal justice system as well and how we are going to go about treating people who are being held for various 
uh, criminal activities. And where the migrant workers are concerned, it's also still equally, it's still very difficult to get the employers to actually abide by the standard operating procedures to make sure that there is a proper space when it comes to the accommodation. I think it's, a, it's going to be an uphill task for the Malaysian government, but I must say that the new human resources minister, Mr. Saravanan has actually, you know, has actually taken an active role to ensure that employers uh, are complying with their SOPs. And so um, uh, you mean standard operating procedures, just for clarity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, um, so I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of, you know, the transmission rates are potentially higher, but that's partly because of the, the higher concentration of people within smaller spaces. But that reinforces the stigma in a way, and it gets you in this kind of vicious cycle of uh, fear, resentment, and perhaps even securitization of the problem. Does, does that, is that what's going on then? I mean, it feeds into you know, the, the narrative that already exists in Malaysia that you know, all migrant workers are bad people and refugees need to be sent back. So you're totally right. But what I would really like people to start thinking about is the fact that we have you know, uh, labor agents and, and middlemen, and we have enforcement authorities that actually you know, close an eye to what's actually happening, the rampant corruption and bribery that's actually happening, that's feeding into labor agents, bringing in people, you know, um, and making sure that they are not doing the kind of work that they are promised, not being paid what they were promised to be paid. And, you know, being, you know, forced to work in very difficult situations, long working hours, and, you know, living in very difficult conditions as well. So I think we really need to, instead of pointing fingers at the migrant workers and refugees and others, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves what's happening here. Because, for example, every migrant worker that comes into Malaysia comes documented. They come with proper legal documents. They become undocumented in Malaysia. But nobody wants to ask the hard, difficult, tough questions as to why this is happening. Who is responsible for this? And why is it that we do not have enforcement authorities going after these labor agents and errant Malaysian employers? Why is it that people who are already victimized keep being victimized over and over? So I think we really need to take a step back and ask all the difficult questions and you know, understand that it is not the migrant workers and the refugees who are the cause of these problems. And so in addition to taking a step back, maybe we could also take a step up. And I want to ask you about what sort of coordinating efforts are there from international agencies? So on the one hand, you have uh, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. On the other hand, you have the World Health Organization looking at the transmission uh, and measures that need to be put into place to, to reduce transmission. And you also have the International Labor Organization looking at uh, forced labor issues and, and, and migration issues. So are these bodies working together on the ground? Is there a presence there? Is there something they're doing? Is there a flow of uh, humanitarian assistance to work on this problem? Well, I'm, I really believe that uh, whether it's the you know, World Health Organization or ILO or UNHCR, that they are having ongoing conversations with the Malaysian government. But I must say that someone like me who actually works on the ground and many other people who work on the ground with refugees or migrant workers we do not we are not privy to these conversations i also think that that in itself is a problem i believe that you know whether for example the unhcr has to be a little bit more inclusive and it has to include uh, organizations that actually work on the ground it has to include community leaders themselves in these conversations so that whatever they are feeding into uh, conversations with the government will have and will reflect the aspirations of those who are being uh, who are actually being exploited on the ground, in this case, the refugees themselves. But I don't really see that happening, and I hope that this will actually change. And your organization is a non-governmental organization. It's called Beyond Borders Malaysia. What are the sorts of activities that it engages in to address uh, the needs of this community? We create opportunities for refugees to actually speak up. And as a result, we have uh, this festival called the Refugee Fest, which actually... Um, creates opportunities and platforms for refugees to be able to articulate their aspirations using arts and performing arts as a tool and a platform. And also working with them uh, over the last five, five and a half years, you know, they, they have been made aware of the fact that art is an important tool and a tool that they can use to speak truth to power. And the Refugee Festival over the last five, five and a half years has 
actually become an advocacy tool in itself. And this year, the Refugee Festival will be held uh, in July. And last year, I stepped down as the festival director because I believe that the festival belongs to the refugees and that they should take ownership of it. So this year, we have a theater director who's trained in the theater of the oppressed. He is an Afghan refugee called uh, Saleh Sepas, and he is he has taken over as the festival director, and I do look forward to seeing how the, the kind of shape that it will take moving forward. We also have ongoing discussions with our allies in parliament, lawmakers whom we work with, to actually push for the right to work, the right to education, and the right to healthcare. And besides that, I also do some research work on the ground looking at atrocity crimes and how primarily following the COVID-19, this has adversely affected vulnerable groups, whether they are refugees or migrant workers as well. And uh, under Beyond Borders, we also have a livelihood initiative called Briani Wallas, where I work with refugee women and single mothers to uh, cook and sell biryani. So we have four different types of biryani, vegetarian, prawn, lamb, and chicken. And uh, they, their work is to cook and my work is to market it and to sell it. Where, and then 60% of the profits go to these women and 40% is absorbed back into the business. Thank you for that. I mean, you know, Malaysian food is probably the best food I've ever eaten in my life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I want to get back to this performing arts uh, element of your work. It's a fascinating example of using the creative arts and performance as an advocacy tool, but also as one... Uh, which invokes this idea of speaking truth to power. And in a podcast on the rights track with Claire Thomas, who's a deputy director of, of Minority Rights Group, they also staged th uh, theater performances throughout the Middle East and North Africa. And I think they got 100,000 people to attend their events. And they did these in bus stations, markets, market squares, public areas where people could gather and have their, their, their awareness raised about a particular issue. Now, of course, your, your refugee festival is, is, is akin to that but also has some difficulties because of COVID. Uh, so large public gatherings are obviously still restricted in some way. So how is the festival, even though you're not the director anymore, but how are they going to stage these events? Are they going to make them smaller and more distributed or what's the plan? When you talk about uh, this minority, minority rights group, you know, taking the festival to, to different parts of, of the city, I, I, I feel really jealous because even before the, the pandemic, you know, we are not allowed to do that. Of course, if we went to night markets and markets and, and places where people will actually gather, we'll have much, many more people watching it, but then that requires special permits and we'll get into trouble and it's just never ending. So over the over four, four days, we actually have about 5,000 people attending it because we also have panel discussions and we have, uh, we, we give out invitations to international schools, schools, universities, and also diplomats. So it's it's kind of manageable. Last year, we couldn't hold it at all. So I did it online. And uh, because of the backlash, many refugees were afraid to sit on the panel. And so I actually had one camera that was fixed on an empty chair to kind of show the absence of refugees. And I must say that it worked well into the conversation because you know, in that, in that absence, that they were also very much present. Now this year, we are hoping that the festival can be held in a, in a physical space. And I know that uh, Saleh is trying to get hold of uh, a place in, in downtown Kuala Lumpur, the federal capital called Rex KL, because, you know, refugees and migrant workers, they live around that area and it's also accessible to public transport. So I'm really hoping that this time around, we'll be able to have the physical festival again. But having said that, last year, because it was an online festival, I realized that the whole world was my platform, that I could call anyone and anyone can perform from anywhere, right? So we were fortunate to also have a conversation with Berus Buchani, and that worked well for the refugees because it was as if though, it, because they really needed that kind of, uh, that kind of kinship. They needed someone like Berus to, to say, hey, I'm here and I know what you're going through and to understand and to have that conversation was really powerful. Yes, the embrace of digital technology and the new platforms that people are working on can have its benefits. And I like this idea of the, the presence of the absence in terms of the, uh, the empty chair. It can be a very powerful uh, signal and symbol. And I guess in closing, I just have a final question for you, uh, Mahi, which is the, given the complexity of the issue, and clearly you're a highly energetic person, passionately devoted to this issue, what are your signs for hope for the future? You know, I must say that we have um, a government that's really difficult for us to work with at this point in time. But I'm one person who believes that 
if we can continue these conversations and we can have communication channels open with the government that at some point we will be able to push for uh, things. For example, um, instead of pushing for the ratification of the 1951 UN Refugee Convention, which is going to take a long, long time, we can actually push for existing legal framework to allow refugees to work because we do have existing legal framework under the Immigration Act. So there are avenues, there are ways to actually uh, approach this conversation. And I always believe that however difficult a government is, we need their political will in order for us to be able to make progress in a more effective and efficient manner. So you know, I'm not sure how difficult it is going to be. We had Pakatan Harapan, which we thought was a more uh, friendly government, but, uh, and yes, you know, it was that much easier to talk to them, but they also had their own vested agenda. And now we have this government, but from my part, I think I'm not going, I'm not, I'm, I know definitely that I'm not going to stop trying. And I believe at some point something has to give. So this combination of awareness raising, advocacy and legal change really come together nicely for you. And uh, I, I admire the fact that you, you, you know, that you're going to continue the struggle and, and continue working on this issue. But for now, I just wanted to thank you so much for sharing uh, all of this incredible insight into a region of the world that, uh, you know, people really need to know about. They need to know about these issues. They need to know about the scale and extent of the problem and the complexities of the problem that really vary from the legal to the social, the economic, the political and, and the cultural. And so for now, just on this episode of The Rights Track, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Rights Track, which was presented by Todd Landman and produced by Chris Garrington of Research Podcasts. You can find out more about the podcast at www.rightstrack.org. Funding for this series comes from the Economic and Social Research Council. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast to access all forthcoming episodes and our fantastic back catalogue of five series of sound evidence on human rights.